The following program is paid for by the ministry partners of the Hour of Power and viewers like you. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning. And welcome church family and visitors. Thank you for joining us. You know, church buildings have been closed for five months, but the actual church, the people have not been closed. Mm -hmm. And the world needs the heaven in you more now than ever. So thank you. Thank you for being a presence of hope and joy and love during this heavy time. We are so grateful for you. And we're so glad you're joining us at this time, inviting us into your home. And we want you to know that even though we are all around the world and we're all in different places, we are together in one spirit, the spirit of Jesus Christ. And we just believe that because you're with us today that God's gonna do something special in your week. And so let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we ask in Jesus' name for an outpouring of your Holy Spirit of your favor, of your forgiveness, of your light, of your life. Lord, we need you and we come running before your throne, Lord, asking for your encouragement. We need heart to get through this difficult time. Help us to be a blessing to our neighbor. Help us to be slow to anger and quick to forgiveness. And Lord, we love you and we thank you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Turn around and shake the hand of the person next to you and say, God loves you and so do I. As Hour of Power continues to have a powerful, positive impact all over the world, we want to say thank you for your ongoing support with our brand new Rejoice Wind Chimes. Perfect for your yard, patio, or anywhere gentle winds blow, this beautiful gift features four cascading aluminum chimes, each inscribed with the words of Psalm 118.24, Today is the day which the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. The ornately cast striker creates a soothing sound on any breezy day. We'll also include a frameable 5x7 card that features a floral motif along with the words of Psalm 118.24. Display it in your home or office and be reminded daily of the truth of this powerful scripture. Call, write, or go online and request the Rejoice Wind Chimes and Keepsake Scripture card. We're asking for your generous gift of $60 or more. For 50 years, Hour of Power has been sharing the joy of the Lord through word and song. And it's because of generous people like you that we've been able to stay on the air. Today, we really need your financial support to help carry us through the summer slump and into the fall. With the ongoing challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic, we're really living in an uncertain time and the message of hope we proclaim is needed now more than ever please prayerfully consider supporting this ministry so we can keep sending the good news of Jesus Christ around the world. Thank you, and remember as always, God loves you, and so do we. In preparation for the message, Luke 11, 5 through 10. Then Jesus said to them, suppose you have a friend, and you go to him at midnight and say, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me, and I have no food to offer him. And suppose the one inside answers, don't bother me. The door is already locked, and my children and I are already in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. So I say to you, ask, 
and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Church family, may we go after God with all boldness. Amen. Sam Collier is an author, podcast host, and speaker. He is also the host of the TV program, A Greater Story with Sam Collier. He and his twin sister were adopted at a young age, and years later, the two were reunited with their birth mother and three siblings on national television. Sam's new book, A Greater Story, is a look at his personal history and a reminder of how God is the ultimate author of life. Please welcome Sam Collier. It's really a privilege to have you here. And so you you have a lot of fans who just love your TV show, your podcast, and it's such a privilege to have you here, Sam. So thank you for joining us. Well, to be with the illustrious Bobby Shuler, you know, I, I just feel like God has uh, blessed me. I feel like I made it today. Thank you, Sam. <laughs> You're sweet. 
Well, uh, well, let's just begin. You have an amazing story. I, I love it. It's, and a big part of it is your, a story with your twin sister and your family. But a lot of people don't know your story and your journey of faith. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Of course, man. Uh, j just really quickly, um, our mother was 21 when she had me and my twin sister. She had three kids already. So there's five kids age 21 in extreme poverty. And um, she was faced with a decision. Should she give us up for adoption or raise us in poverty? She gave us up. Uh, we got adopted by a couple who had just given their life to Christ. My father who adopted me was 50 at the time. It was kind of wow. his last kind of shot at doing it right, right? When he gave his life to Christ. When my parents came to adopt us after they had been got married and realized they couldn't have kids. Um, the lady who was running the agency said, you don't want to adopt them. They're probably not going to be much because oh. you see where they come from poverty. And I forgot to mention my biological father was addicted to all types of drugs and substances. And so she saw that kind of on our rap sheet around two months when they came to adopt us. Um, and she said that they, they, she counted us out. And mm -hmm. uh, my parents formed what I call a little, you know, prayer closet. I don't know if you seen the movie War Room before. Yeah, yeah, and sure. So, <laughs> uh, out of that movie, they kind of took, you know, something from that film, the, the prayer closet. Yeah. And they prayed to God, God, what would you have us do? And God, they said, God said to them, these are your kids. They're going to be okay. Amen. Long story short, Bobby, they take us home. My sister gets all A's from kindergarten up to 12th grade, becomes an industrial engineer, Spelman, Georgia Tech grad. And I'm here with Bobby, right? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> Thanks, Sam. You know, let me ask yeah. you a lot of, I think a lot of um, young pregnant women who are debating putting their child up for adoption or keeping the child, sometimes they feel like they, that keeping it is always the right thing to do. But it seems like in your story that maybe it was good for your mom to put you guys up for adoption. What are your, I don't know, what are your sensibilities about that? And what's your opinion? Do you think it was good that your mom did that? Or, or how do you feel? Yeah, you know, depending on who you talk to, you know, adoptees all respond to it differently. I think yeah. for me, I, because of the grace of God and how he just kind of weaved the story together, it, I, be, I believe it was the Lord's will yeah. um, that we be given up for adoption. Um, you know, the whole nature versus nurture thing is real. But honestly, I do believe that God was wanting to uh, create an interruption in our bloodline because there was so much poverty. There was so many, so much drugs. So much. I mean, it, yeah. I mean, we're, I'm here today because of <laughs> yeah. um, what God did. And so, yes, I thoroughly believe that it was the Lord's will for her. I, I have a friend, too, who's adopted, and he says, you know, your parents had to have you, but my parents chose me. You know, like, they got to <laughs> pick who they wanted. They picked me. You know, there's something special about being adopted, too, isn't there? 100 percent. And, and I do think it, you know, uh, for, for those that have been adopted, you have really two choices. You can choose to live out of the abandonment, mm -hmm. or you can choose to live out of the place of being chosen. And I think for us, we chose to live out of that place because the reality is we were chosen. So. Yeah, amen. Well, and that's really what you talk, a big part of your new book, A Greater Story. Tell us what, what got you to this place where you're like, okay, I need to sit in front of a typewriter or computer and I need, I need to get this book out of me. What was, what was behind that? Yeah, 100%. You know, um, after my sister became an industrial engineer, right? And I went on to do the things that I'm doing in ministry and television and all that other stuff. Um, uh, we had a little bit of a family moment around age 24. Um, I, there's a little tradition in, in, that we had in our house called NFL football. <laughs> and uh, we were, <laughs> we, you know, during COVID, we haven't been able to see it lately, but um, we, we did that. And the rule was you don't talk. And so we didn't talk. And my dad breaks the rule and he decides he wants to speak. And he says, it's time for you to go find your biological family. And Whoa. I said, like, what do you mean? He said, well, I mean, you could grow up one day and marry your cousin and you would never know it. <laughs> <laughs> just, you know, it's just his logic. And uh, um, long Funny. story short, um, he, he says that the Lord told him the Steve Harvey show was going to help us do it. And I thought he was crazy and got up and left. And they call us a year later after my sister had written into the show two weeks prior to my dad saying this. Um, and they said, we think we can help you find your biological family. And do you want to do it? I said, let me call you back called my sister, I said, do you want to do it? She said, no, Yeah. but I feel like we have to do it. This doesn't just happen. Mm. 
we go on the show. They say, we're so sorry we didn't find anybody. We hired a private detective, but we want you to make a plea. We go to commercial break. We come back after commercial and Steve Harvey sits down and he says, I know we said we didn't find your birth mother, but that's not the case. Eleanor, come on out. Wow. And we meet our biological mother and our three siblings on national television. So you had and three so out other of that siblings. Space, the book. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> what an amazing story. What was that like? Did you feel happy, sad? I mean, it must have been a flurry of emotions for you. Yeah. I mean, if you have a moment, anyone to watch the clip, you can look at, you know, just type in Steve Harvey, Sam Collier on Google. When my mother walks out, I just freeze. I just yeah, freeze. Yeah. My sister's crying. And I'm honestly saying to myself, I think you should be crying right now yeah. because that's what you, you know, but I was so frozen. I didn't know which emotion to choose. So happy, sad, angry, excited. So I just put my head down and then the Lord said, snap out of it. And I did and gave her a hug. Uh, so it, it was it was a lot. This a lot. this event was really important for you, wasn't it? In shaping. I mean, I, I, there's like I feel like in life there are some key events in our lives that shape how we think about ourselves, how we think about God. Did this do that to you? Was this one of those events? And how did it shape your views? Did it? Yeah, 100 percent. You know, people ask me all the time, you know, why do you think your dad who adopted us, who raised us, pushed you guys to do this? And I said, you know, I think for him, the thought was in order to really maximize where you're going, you have to know where you came from. Mm -hmm. he, he believed that there were things that we were missing that we needed. And, you know, I, I, the adoption was done so well that we weren't rich. You know, we were it was middle class. We didn't have everything we wanted. We had everything we needed. Um, so so the, the holes that may come with being given up for adoption weren't there because our parents raised us so well. But my dad still said there's some things that you need to know that will help you maximize where you're going. And I think for me, when you talk about this idea of faith and the faith journey, I think the biggest thing that it taught me um, was that God is writing a better story than the one uh, that we know mm -hmm. that his ways are not our ways. His thoughts are, are, are not our thoughts. He sits high above, he looks low and he sees what we can't see. He plans the beginning from the end. And even though we may not understand why everything is happening the way that it's happening in the moment, at some point we will look back and go, wow, that is why God did that. It's hard, isn't it? I mean, there's a lot of people right now who, you know, they're losing their salon, their restaurant, their customers, or they're sick, or they've lost a loved one, or, and there's so much anxiety about the future of America and the world. How do, what do you say to people right now who are just kind of struggling, who are on edge during this time? They're like, I wanna trust God. I just, I don't, ha I don't have that feeling. I don't feel, you know, how, how do you encourage someone like that to trust the Lord through this time? Yeah, I would say the disciples were in the same situation. Mm -hmm. They were sitting in the boat with Jesus the storm breaks out mm -hmm. and they start panicking. God, where are you at? Is really the questions that they're asking. God, what are you doing? Uh, Jesus, wake up, right? I mean, mm -hmm. like, yeah. what, where, where are you? And they wake him up and Jesus says to them something that I'll never forget that I think is a message to all of us in this season. Oh, ye of little faith is what he said. Amen. Yeah. Tra translation, <laughs> where's your faith? Yeah. Where's your faith? I think Jesus was creating the priority. What, notice what he didn't say. He didn't say, are you okay? Mm -hmm. He, he yeah. didn't encourage them, hey, it's going to be okay. He said, <laughs> We're, oh, ye of little faith. Yeah. Your, in other words, you are in a storm, but the Messiah is in the boat with you. The savior of the world, the creator of the elements is with you. And if, and yeah. if I am with you, you will be okay. Amen. Whether I stop the storm or give you the strength to make it through. And I think we have to remember that. Amen. Great. The book is called A Greater Story, My Rescue, My Purpose, and Our Place in God's Plan. It's available anywhere uh, books are sold. Sam Collier, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it, and we love your story. Thank you for encouraging everybody. We appreciate you. Thank you, Bobby. You're a legend, and it's just an honor to know you. Thank you, man. Thanks, Sam. Get the book. It's great. You'll enjoy it. God bless you. Bless you.
As Hour of Power continues to have a powerful, positive impact all over the world, we want to say thank you for your ongoing support with our brand new Rejoice Wind Chimes. Perfect for your yard, patio, or anywhere gentle winds blow, this beautiful gift features four cascading aluminum chimes, each inscribed with the words of Psalm 118.24, Today is the day which the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. The ornately cast striker creates a soothing sound on any breezy day. We'll also include a frameable 5x7 card that features a floral motif along with the words of Psalm 118.24. Display it in your home or office and be reminded daily of the truth of this powerful scripture. Call, write, or go online and request the Rejoice Wind Chimes and Keepsake Scripture card. We're asking for your generous gift of $60 or more. For 50 years, Hour of Power has been sharing the joy of the Lord through word and song, and it's because of generous people like you that we've been able to stay on the air. Today, we really need your financial support to help carry us through the summer slump and into the fall. With the ongoing challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic, we're really living in an uncertain time, and the message of hope we proclaim is needed now more than ever please prayerfully consider supporting this ministry so we can keep sending the good news of Jesus Christ around the world. Thank you, and remember as always, God loves you, and so do we.
are, would you join us this morning? Stand with me. Hold your hands out like this as a way of receiving from the Lord. And let's say this together. I'm not what I do. I'm not what I have. I'm not what people say about me. I am the beloved of God. It's who I am. No one can take it from me. I don't have to worry. I don't have to hurry. I can trust my friend Jesus and share his love with the world. Thank you. Please be seated. Things are really weird today. I, I think I talk about it almost every single Sunday about how strange it is to live in a world that's shut down but not shut down. That has this disease and yet, you know, you wonder, you know, where everybody is that's sick. They're in the hospital or maybe they're at home. Maybe that's a good thing. You wonder what's going to happen to your favorite restaurant or to your business or to Disneyland or to movie theaters or to our country. And it's easy to feel like everything's going to be worse. That when this is over, we're going to be like some nation that has been bombed to smithereens and we're going to have to sort of rebuild and years and years it's going to take to get back. And can I just tell you something that I think? Now, let me tell you something that I know. Everything is going to be amazing. I believe more and more that it is human nature to catastrophize bad situations. I don't think it's good to be in denial. I don't think it's good to, to just say, ah, who cares, and to think it's not going to require effort or even some hard work or that there aren't trials and difficult things ahead of us. But if I know anything, I know this. We serve a good God and good things are about to come. And for those of you, I know we have people watching all over the world, but I want to talk to my countrymen, to Americans. I believe in us as a people. I believe there's something special about Americans. We're not a race. We're an idea. We're an idea that is manifested in things like ingenuity and creativity, equality and liberty and hard work. And I think that these ideals of democracy and republicanism, which are founded, I believe, on the biblical idea of the value of every man, woman and child and their ability to get up in the morning and to make of the world what they will and to pursue happiness and a business and a relationship and a family in their own way, in their own right. I believe that's one of the greatest ideas that's ever blessed human history. And I believe that that idea carried us through in the past and it will carry us through again. Americans have an amazing ability to take a tragedy in a difficult situation and somehow turn it into some amazing thing. I've lived through a handful of these types of global events in my life, and they were all horrible. I'll never forget 9-11, when we watched thousands of fellow Americans and other nationalities, Canadians and others, uh, murdered at the hands of some distant enemy that many of us didn't even know existed, and thought for maybe a year, I don't know if the world will ever be the same. Is this the end of America? Will we go into a global war? But as you look, that, that decade continued to flourish in prosperity as things like iPhones and, and, and new parks and new ways of people communing with one another and all sorts of creative things and changed. And a lot of cities like New York that were riddled with crime were becoming safer because of the ingenuity, the pursuit of liberty, the friendship, the moral character of so many who refused to believe that that would destroy America. 2008, very similar thing happened. It felt like maybe this is the end of the world when everything was crashing down economically and there was this bubble that burst and yet look at the economic prosperity we just came from. I believe, I know that the best is yet to come for America. And I believe for all of you and other countries too, when you embrace the ideas of liberty, of the pursuit of happiness, and in particular, turn your eyes to heaven 
and pray. I believe God will hear and will take something that has been awful and hard and not bring you back to where you were, but bring you back to even something better. You'll look back and say, I don't even miss those days. I love what God has brought me to today. In America, it's an election year and we have a Democrat running and we have a Republican running. And both of them have claimed, I know because I get letters and emails almost every week, and both of them say the same thing. This election is the most important election that has ever happened. If you don't vote for this Democrat, or if you don't vote for this Republican, America is over. And I have a one word response to that claim. This is for both parties. Hogwash. That is hogwash. We do not believe that any single man can save or destroy this country. This country is not made great by any one man or woman. It's made great by its people. It's made great by men and women and even children who believe in liberty, who believe in industry, and who believe in the very strong arms of providence. If any one man destroys America, it will be because we gave him the power to save it. We do not believe in kings here. We look, when we look to one man, there is only one man we look to, and his name is Jesus Christ. And, there, and he's the one that can save us. And that gives us the ability to wake up in the morning and not blame someone else. You have the power, despite what's happening all around you. Yes, you're going through a hard time. Yes, there are challenges. Yes, there are roadblocks before you. But you have the power today to get up and make of life what you choose. So pray and trust that God will take you to an even better future than the good past you had. You are walking away from a good past to embrace a great future. I believe that for you. So wake up, get out of bed, build your house, till your ground, tend your sheep, and slay your dragon. The world stands before you for the taking. Don't blame someone else for the problems in the world. Take responsibility and know that if we as a people get up and decide that democracy is still what really matters, that liberty matters, that ingenuity matters, that freedom matters, and that friendship, and especially the good providence of God, that the best is yet to come for America. And we have friends in Canada, we have friends in China, we have friends in Hong Kong and New Zealand and Australia and Germany and the Netherlands and Switzerland and all around the world. We want to say, I just believe the best is coming for your nation. Believe in your people. Don't believe in some great leader. Believe in the people and trust that when we turn our hearts to God, he hears from heaven. So many, I think, are saying, Bobby, what about all the sins of America? What about all the mistakes that we've made? Haven't we calmed down the road of perdition? Can't we turn back and, and go back to where we used to be? America has always had sins. America's always had people going down the road of perdition. But there has always been a remnant that has prayed, that has sought after God. And God will hear them. He will hear the man, the woman, or even the child who stands in the gap of faith and says, Lord, forgive us. And, you know, send your favor upon us and carry us through this difficult time. Look to Nineveh. When God called Jonah to Nineveh, Nineveh and the Assyrians were one of the most evil nations in the world. But when Jonah prophesied to them in the simplest of terms, they all repented. The king repented and the people repented and even the animals repented. And what happened? God relented from his wrath and he showed mercy to them and they prospered. Look to the Babylonian exile. I think when the Jews went to Babylon because of their sins, they thought it was all over. That maybe this was the end of their people that maybe what God said to Moses, I'll destroy them and start a new people with you, that maybe that's what was happening then. But the end of the Babylonian era led to the rabbinic age of rabbis and the temple and, and, and synagogues and children learning. And this created 
this amazing thing in which Jesus emerges as the Messiah. When we're going through hard times, we sometimes forget that God sometimes uses these hard times as birthing pains. I believe God is going to use this hard time as a birthing pain for America and for your nation. And I believe that if we turn to him and we pray with all our hearts and we repent of our sin and we respond in faith, that God will pour out so much blessing, there won't be enough room to contain it. Look at the revolution in America. When that happened, people weren't sure and, and fellow Americans disagreed with one another and there were major issues that were left on the table like emancipation and slavery. And yet, through all of that, our founding fathers prayed and believed that this dream that came from scripture, that this, look at this, this is a picture of our founding fathers praying. I wish our politicians would pray like this today. Now, you know, on their knees, bowed down, weeping. I believe God saw that despite some of these are, some of these are wicked men. Most of them are good men. And they prayed and they trusted that God could do something great. And it was actually after the revolution that this thing called the Great Awakening happened in America, where there was a tremendous revival and move of God. And from that Great Awakening, historians believe that emancipation of slavery and women's suffrage and other important civil rights issues emerged out of a sense of not secular justice, but biblical justice. The idea that God has a way of fairness in the world. When the Civil War happened, more Americans were dying every day, and it was a sad time for our country, but out of the Civil War came the Industrial Revolution. Many of you watching today lived through the Second World War, an incredible time in world history. I can't imagine what it would have felt like living through the Second World War, where in one lifetime people were going from cart and buggy to man on the moon. You watched two whole cities in Japan destroyed by a nuclear bomb. The emergence of the Cold War and other issues and just thinking, what will the world come to after so much fighting and carnage and evil? And yet after World War II, America entered into one of its most prosperous times ever. Who remembers this famous picture of the victory over Japan day? You see, when I believe that when people are in a tough time, it is so easy to believe that things are just going to get worse. That is so true. It is so easy to catastrophize tough times. But get your hopes up. Get ready because God's about to do something wonderful in this country and wonderful in your life. All that we must do is trust, believe, repent, pray, and seek God with all our heart and watch what he can do. God can do a lot with a little bit of faith. I know that it is human nature to believe that when things are really good, they're going to be great forever. And when things are really bad, they're going to be really bad forever. It's not the truth. Life is like waves. It's like surfing. They come in sets. Some are bigger than others. You'll ride it out and it'll be lots of fun. So we got to pray. We got to look to the Lord. We need to repent. We need to turn our hearts. We need to be kind to one another. We need to forgive each other. We need to be people of peace and people of hard work and people who promote the ideas, not of a single person, but the ideas of liberty, that the individual who trusts in God can make anything of their life. And you can. I believe in you. Remember what the scripture says. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. God's gonna heal our land. God's gonna heal our land. He's gonna heal our state. He's gonna heal our, our country. He's gonna heal our world. And he's gonna do it because of good people like you who seek after him with all their hearts. He's gonna do it because people like you decided to pray to pray us into victory. And that's what we're going to do. That's what we're going to do. When we pray, Jesus teaches us to pray with chutzpah. Chutzpah. Now, uh, chutzpah is this 
Jewish or Yiddish word that comes from the Hebrew word for faith, which is this idea of not just trust, and it is that, but a sort of passionate pursuit to the point of even being annoying. <laughs> I, there's a great story in the Gospels about Jesus. I know he's had this mob of people following him everywhere. And he and his disciples, they like need a break. So they go to this northern Gentile region called Tyre and Sidon. This is actually the same area where Elijah went and, uh, you know, did the, the miracle to the, the widow who had just a little bit of oil and a little bit of flour left. He provided a miracle to her so that she could continue to eat and, in fact, raised her son from the dead. So this is, in, in Judaism, a really important place. It's here that Jesus goes with his disciples, and it's there that they're actually kind of, it seems like they're hiding in a house. And a local Gentile woman, not Jewish, not a religious woman that we know of, cries out to Jesus. And she keeps crying out. And her disciples say, go away. And she keeps saying, Jesus, do you hear me? Are you in there? Heal my daughter. Heal my daughter, Lord. Finally, his disciples, they go in and they say, Rabbi, can you send this woman away? She is driving us crazy. Jesus goes out to her and he says, she says, Rabbi, Rabbi, heal my daughter. And he says to her, it sounds so mean. It sounds so mean. It's one of the few times Jesus sounds really mean in this way, but there's a reason he's doing it. He says to her, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. Now remember, this woman's people, the Syrophoenician woman and Jews are rivals. They've been, they have long memories. They have been sometimes enemies. Her people are sort of like Canaanites. So there's this, this rivalry where Jesus effectively is saying to her what most Jews believe in those days, but I don't think Jesus does, and I'll explain it. He's doing something called, called Vahomer, but he says to her, I've come for the lost sheep of Israel. It's a test. And she says, Lord, please save my daughter. And he says, this is the bad line. It is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to dogs. Oh, that's pretty brutal. Now, if I was asking someone for a favor and this guy called me a dog, I'd think it was over, wouldn't you? Not for this woman. She's got a chutzpah kind of faith. She's got a chutzpah kind of prayer. She doesn't care. She doesn't, she doesn't care. And she says to him, not so, Lord. Even dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the children's table. What does Jesus say? Is there any greater faith in all of Israel? I think Jesus likes this kind of thing. And his, her daughter was healed that day. God loves a chutzpah kind of prayer, a passionate prayer, a prayer that is not perfectly planned necessarily, it can be, but a prayer that is prayed with passion, with fire, with life, with everything in you. That's the way Jesus likes for us to pray. I still remember last Christmas, we had, I think, five Christmas Eve services. They went every hour on the hour. I think it was one, two, three, four, and five. And we just turned them around. They were 45 minutes, beautiful candlelit services, a full orchestra and choir. What a beautiful celebration it was. I remember in the very first service, I was sitting just over there. And on the front row where Hannah is sitting, there was a, an older middle-aged woman, a Muslim woman, who was wearing a hijab. And she had on her lap a Quran. And she had her hand on the middle of the Quran. And she looked distressed, not a little distressed. She was crying and she looked almost angry, like her face was like this. And I'm not going to say, I, and I feel bad about my prejudice, you know. I'm not going to say I was worried, but I'm also going to say I wasn't relaxed. And I was wondering, what is this Muslim woman doing on Christmas Eve in my church, all torn to pieces like this? And she just, through every song, people are singing, joy to the world, the Lord. And she's like, you know, just, just so hurting. And so I got up and I preached the message. I preached the gospel. 
And at the end, she began to walk out. And I chased after her. And I said, thank you. Thank you for coming to our church on Christmas Eve. You honor us with your presence. And she turned to me with a big smile and she said, thank you for the service. It was beautiful. And she held her Quran open before me and in it was a picture of her son. And she said, pastor, my son, he's sick and he might be dying. Will you pray for him? Pray for him. This woman was Muslim. She prays five times a day to the east towards Mecca. But today, this day, like the Syrophoenician woman, she came to a different house, to a different faith, and asked God to heal her son. And I prayed for that man. And she said to me, Pastor, if I bring my son here, I believe God can heal him. If I bring him here, will you pray for him? And I said, you bring him, I will pray for him. And she left. Four more services went by and she never came. And I thought to myself, man, I wish I had gone to the hospital. There's part of me that says, should I have le just left a Christmas Eve service, left thousands of people to pray for this young man? I wonder what the story would have been. And even to this day, I regret it. Isn't that, isn't that an interesting story, isn't it? I'm sorry there's not a great ending to give you. That's it. And, and I, I think w when I hear the story of the Syrophoenician woman, I, I think of this woman, and I still have her memory in my heart. The prayer of a mother who doesn't care. I'm just gonna find some way for God to heal my kid. This is how this woman, the Syrophoenician woman prayed. This is how God wants us to pray. With all our heart, with all our soul, with all our strength and to trust and believe that when we pray, he hears, he's able, and that he wants to deliver something really special. God's gonna bring breakthrough for you. Pray with faith. Don't stop praying. Keep knocking. Keep asking. Pray for our country. Pray for our world. And be the kind of person that people need today. Not an angry, wrathful, bitter, anxious person. That's not you. Be a person of peace. Forgiving. Pray with people today when they're hurting. Who cares if they're not Christians? If, they're, if they say they're worried, ask them to pray. Watch that God will do something in that moment. Just, just pray for them. You don't have to pray something special. It'll mean a lot to them. And it'll mean a lot to the Lord. And it'll mean a lot to you. And you might, never, you, might, you might just really change someone's heart. You might. Two parables Jesus tells he, that are similar to this. It's called in rabbinic teaching, rabbis use this a lot. It's called kal vahomer. It means heavy and light. If this is so, then how much more so is it true with the Lord? Jesus, of course, does this a lot. You know, if a child asks his father for bread, is he going to give him a stone? Or if he asks for fish, is he going to give him a snake? How much more, even though you're evil, how much more will your heavenly father who loves everybody and loves you with all his heart and his soul, how, is he going to, how much more is he going to give you what you need when you need it? Jesus says, look to the birds of the air. Look at the lilies of the field that are just, that wither and die. And if, if God makes, dresses them, how much more is he going to dress you? If God cares for them, how much more is he going to care for you? And he tells these two stories. The first is famous. It's the unjust judge parable. Now in Hebrew, the word for judge is also the word for defender or fighter. This word is sofit, sofit. And it's a word play and it's important because uh, this is a, a, a common title that the Jews use for God. That on one hand, he's a judge, but on another hand, he's like your defender. He fights for you. In Psalm 68, 5, the scripture says this about God, that a father to the fatherless, a defender of widows. So that word defender there is so fit. So you wouldn't say a judge of widows, because that sounds like he's being rude to them. In, in this case, it's a defender of the widows. He fights for the widows and is a God in his holy dwelling. So when Jesus tells the story about the judge, the Hebrew people are hearing God. The story goes like this. He says, there was a woman 
And she came before the judge who was wicked and unjust and didn't care. And she said, give me justice against my adversary. And he continued to ignore her and neglect her and turn her away. But because she was so persistent, he finally said, fine, I'll give you justice. Just leave me alone. And Jesus says, if this sophit, if this defender or judge who is wicked, who doesn't care about justice, is going to respond to this woman who's knocking, how much more will God, who is just, loving, kind, who, who thinks of you as his favorite, how much more is he going to come to your aid if you continue to seek after him? Jesus says then that there is this, another parable in Luke 11. There's a, a story about a neighbor who, you know, in, in those days, people are always traveling, especially merchants, and there's many reasons why you're going to end up late and why you can't just stop and sleep on the side of the road. It's dangerous. And so you never know when a family member or a friend is going to knock on your door and they're going to be hungry and they're going to want a bed and they're going to want to see you. Well, in this story, he says that, you know, it's a hospitality culture. And in Jesus' day, people, you know, being hospitable is at the core of who they are. I mean, you in those days, you could be a complete stranger and you knock on the door of someone and it's like for three days at least, they're going to care for you and take care of you. The Middle East is still very much this way. And so Jesus says that a man had a friend who visited him at, in the middle of the night. And it maybe let's say it's three in the morning or something. And he knocks on the door and this neighbor had no food for his friend. So he goes to his next door neighbor's house to get some food and he knocks on the door. Now, when we hear that, we go, oh my gosh, the guy in this story, that's the weird one, is the guy knocking. But the weird one is actually the neighbor who comes to the door and won't give him any food, actually. That's how it is in a hospitality culture. Normally, your next door neighbor would be like, oh my gosh, you don't have any food? Wait right there. I'll get you some. What do you need? I got, I got some rye. I got some. You need some wine? You need some water? What do you need? Okay, okay, okay. Okay, here, here, here. Because he doesn't want his neighbor to be embarrassed. He wants his neighbor to feel like he's, you know, they help each other. And so when Jesus says that the neighbor won't even get out of bed, Jesus' audience isn't thinking about the guy knocking. They're thinking that the guy that won't get out of bed is, is a, like the unjust judge. You know, he's just this rotten person, a horrible person. And he gives the lamest excuse. I can't get up. I've already locked the door. Right? How hard is it to go, you know, unlock the door? And yet the neighbor, you know, normally this would be a huge insult and maybe they would hate each other forever. But this neighbor is not offended. He's not hurt. He doesn't care. He just keeps knocking. Knock, 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 pan, 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 pan. And Jesus says, not because he's a good person, but because he wants to go back to bed. The neighbor gets up and he gives him the food he needs and he goes back to bed. If that's how a wicked, evil neighbor is, how much more will God, who doesn't sleep, who has a cattle on a thousand hills, who sees you as his beloved daughter or his beloved son, whose favorite thing in the world to do is bless you and love you and care for you, how much more will he come to your aid if you continue to knock and continue to pray? Friend, I want you to know that the world has enough bad news. It has enough bad news. And the world has enough to worry about tomorrow. We are gonna be people who build hope. That is what we do. We are going to be people who remember that America has been through worse than this, much worse. And we are the kinds of people who can take these types of things. And if we trust in God and we pray and we think creatively and we work hard and we keep our hopes alive and, and continue to, to respect one another and love one another, that God can do amazing things. I believe the best days of America the best days for your country, the best days are ahead of us, not behind us. Not because I believe in a person, but because I believe in a people. If I believe in any person, it's Jesus Christ. And I believe that there will always be people in this country who to the benefit of the whole will continue to pray, will continue to repent, and like a priestly class, we'll continue to stand in the gap. Though not everybody is there, we will pray and we will stand in the gap and believe that God will do tomorrow what he did yesterday. And that is to take our tragedies and turn them into triumphs. To take our difficulties and turn them into victories. To take times like these, not to divide us, but to bring us together with friendship, with brotherly kindness, with forgiveness, mercy, with joy, and maybe with a good meal. 
That's what we do. That's who we are. That's what we believe in, liberty. We believe in ingenuity. We believe in industry. And we believe most of all in the very, very strong arms of God. So pray, pray with me and then relax and trust that God is up to something good in this country, in your country, and in your life. Father, we thank you that you love us and we turn our hearts to you. And whatever sins we have in our life, we repent. Not, not because we need to feel shame and guilt, but because we wanna do better. We wanna be better. Lord, forgive us for the ways we've been unkind and unforgiving and the ways that we've slandered our neighbor. Help us to have kindness and, and mercy in our hearts. Help us to be more relaxed and slow to anger and to love one another. Lord, you loved us and you still love us even when we mess up. We thank you that you never abandon us. We thank you that if we're alive today, we have a reason to get up in the morning and we have a reason to praise your name. And it is in your mighty name we pray, amen. The preceding program was paid for by the ministry partners of the Hour of Power and viewers like you and is accredited by the Evangelical Council for Financial Accountability.